urbane, civil, civilized, civil, they all come from sort of the idea of town living. Uh, so they want to promote the idea of towns as a civilizing force and also uh, a force that would, that would anglicize Ireland, make it more English. Um, so certainly the plantation is about promoting new, new settlements. Uh, and these settlements have to be given some form of government. The, the, the reason for the charters themselves, 1613 charters, specifically is more to do with the short term need to try and um, rebalance, as they would put it, or pack, as we would say, the Irish Parliament. The, the Irish Parliament met in Dublin was consisted of two members from each county in Ireland and two members from each borough. So to increase the membership of it, you needed to increase the number of boroughs. That's the times that actually were intended to send members to Parliament. All these new landowners that are coming in for the plantation wanted representation, and the government wanted representative as well. Uh, so they created these boroughs. In some cases, in time, which already existed, but in some cases, in time, which didn't exist, which got boroughs anyway. Some of these towns go on like Belfast to go and thrive. Some of them, like Charmont, just disappear again. But however, uh, Belfast, as part of this process, does get a charter in 1613, which sets up a form of government. As I say, the state of Belfast had been granted the author of the Church He's bringing in settlers, as mentioned, the settlers from England, Scotland, and the Isle of Man in the early days. The charter is granted in 1613, when there's some sort of town ready in place. And the population grows through the, through the 17th century. It's only sort of guesses that we have, so you're guessing a population of around 1,000 by 1645, going up to about 5,000 in 1706. The system which the, the charter set up, it's similar to all of these towns. There's about 40 borders created in the early years of the 17th century across Ireland, most of them in Ulster. They all had more or less the same system of government set up. There was a corporation which consisted of the Lord of the Castle, who is the landowner, which is Sir Arthur Chichester. There's the constable of the castle of Belfast, who is somebody appointed by uh, Chichester. And then there is a corporation consisting of 13 individuals, a sovereign and 12 burgesses. And then there's the freemen of the town. Now, the burgesses elect the sovereign every year. The burgesses are named in the first charter, and they're all people who have connections with Chichester, one way or the other. Thereafter, it's what's called a self-perpetuating oligarchy, so the Burgesses nominate their own replacement, so if one land dies, the, the remaining Burgess get together and actually elect the new Burgess. So it's a closed system. Uh, Chichester nominate the first Burgesses and they then nominate their own successors, so it's a closed system and it puts all the power really in the hand of the landowner, Chichester. You also see at the bottom of the structure I mentioned Freeman. Those are people who are declared free of the town, who have the right to live there and to do business there. They have theoretically a place in the government of the town, because that's how the theory of government of that period works, that the freemen should be involved um, in the government. However, how they were supposed to be involved is a bit, is, is a bit vague. There's no common council, as you get in some in, in English towns and cities. There appeared to be an idea that the freemen would have public meetings and then sort of feed in the decision making. There's some debate about whether this happens at all. Um, it's been suggested that there is some sort of gesture towards including the freemen in the government at the time. Um, you do occasionally have these meetings where freemen were sort of there involved in decision making. Uh, but it's all a bit vague. Uh, but there's no doubt that the actual power in the town was just and his nominees. It was a family town. And it remains largely a family town until the 1840s. And as late as that, the Chichester's name, the later the common Marcus of Donegal, and the Marcus of Shazbury, uh, they are really running the, 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 the town. They own the town physically, they own most of it. Uh, and they are they, 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 they the dominant force. Now, the records of this, this is often known as the Old Corporation. It runs from 1613 to 1842. The records of it are just in two volumes. There's the Town Book and the Assembly Book. The Town Book is still in private ownership. There is a copy of it in here. There's a micro microphone copy of it in Prone. It was also edited and published uh, by one of the great Victorian antiquarians, R.M. Young. 
and his version of it was republished a few years ago by City Council. So it is fairly easy to get your hands on a copy of the town book. Um, you only have transcribed it. Uh, facsimile of what the original looks like and then his facsimile. Uh, it's an interesting volume. It's a bit of a mess, to be quite honest. It's not a coherent account of what happened in the town. Um, it takes, it's theoretically, it covers the period from 1613 down to 1751. It's not a consistent account. Um, you have some things like the, the elections of the sovereigns usually recorded there, or recorded the elections of the two MPs, uh, and of the Irish Parliament there generally recorded. Other things are sometimes recorded and sometimes not. It's a real mix of, of, of material. Uh, it doesn't run chronologically always. It jumps back and forth and there's lots of strange material, so it's a bit of a problem to actually use. But the sort of things you would get into, for instance, um, that is um, another slide I wasn't expecting. Um, but that's just an example of a page from the, the time book showing the sort of things that they were doing. I'm possibly trying to find his notes on that particular one. Um, I don't know how that Right, well what they're doing in this, you get examples of the, the, the corporation actually doing things to show on the town. I don't actually have that particular page there. Um, but that has to do with trying to, um, yeah, this is about, I mentioned Freeman. This is about people coming, I think, from, from outside the town, coming in and actually trading in the town. This is one of the, one of the obsessions uh, of, 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 of the corporation, was to, to restrict the actual trading in the town. Uh, to people who actually live there. Um, you've got other things, for instance, you have them um, passing bylaws, for instance, March 1638, they, um, they pass a bylaw about malt, malt cuttings have been around in the town and these are a fire hazard. Um, and they pass a bylaw 1638 saying these have to be put outside the boundaries of the town because they're a fire hazard. You have uh, occasionally you have petitions, for instance, a petition from 1870-something, um, I'm going to date on this, uh, where the um, freemen of the town, is that all the tailors that live in the town are complaining there's people from outside the town coming in and selling all these tailors. And the freemen are saying that they pay their taxes in the town and they don't want these people from outside coming in and trading in the town. So you have issues like that being, all done, being, being dealt with by the corporation. Um, and that, that's just more examples there. That's the Taylor's petition there. And that's one about the milk I'm coming back on course. Um, and again, um, this is an idea of the, the, the freemen being involved. Because this talks about a court of assembly, which suggests that a lot of the people actually in the time were brought together as for some sort of public meeting. And they sort of try and um, codify the bylaws of the town in this, which is quite interesting. And they talk, for instance, about looking after the poor. So they talk about the poor's money. This is money that various people have left to the town for the, to help the poor people. This actually has an interesting history, this poor's money, because it all disappears. And there's a big row about this in 1830. There's a inquiry to find out what happened to all this money. Um, that's the name of the track down actually. But there was money around in the 17th century, which people were left for the period of time. So this is saying that uh, especially the corporation don't look after for people. Um, yeah, I think the certain people decided they would take it away and invest it, and that, uh, I've seen that. But there is provision being made for the poor. There's talking about regulating beggars, for instance, there, there as well. This is always a big issue in uh, early modern societies, you know, when people come in begging, and this is you know, how to deal with them, get them out of the town again, how to deal with orphan children. So there, there, there's a range of things that are really rich in measures, but an important thing is the market's quite important in, in the town, so how the market's going to be organised. And one there are even about street lighting, about telling people, oh, I should wish to stick a lamp outside their house during the month or months, things like that. So the corporation is sort of doing things to help run the town, make, make the town a better place to be. <coughs> And as I say, that's available. There's this sort of continuation volume of it is known as the assembly book. This hasn't been published, though there's been a couple of suggestions that it could be. Um, it's sort of less interesting. Uh, it contains mainly lists of things, lists of people, lists of things. Some most of them about the poor in it actually there. I think that's a list of sort of people who are getting uh, grants from this poor fund. So you're, you're actually in that case getting names of people. 
It's just interesting because you rarely get the names of sort of pretty poor people coming up in the century. And that's a list of sort of widows and orphans that are actually being given grants from the poor men. You also get, uh, towards the end of the 18th century, there are sort of um, public meetings being taking place and being recorded in, into the time book um, or into the assembly book. That's quite a, a famous meeting, 1781, where a lot of people put up a petition for a public meeting. Uh, this is in the whole form. Uh, business is going on towards the end of the 18th century, uh, during the, um, the aftermath of the um, American Revolution and, and, and the French Revolution. There's a reform in there. This is a lot of the citizens coming to the sense that they want a public meeting. Uh, of the principal hands, and they want to actually give instructions to the two MPs who represent the town in Parliament and tell them how to vote. Now, the two MPs responded to this to them go because they weren't, they weren't answerable to the people in the town as they told them, they are answerable to the Lord Chichester. But it's an interesting example of you know, the, the, the political ideas at the time, and there's some quite well known names in there in the history. Odell Cunningham signs that, uh, Thomas McCabe is also signing that. Quite a lot of people are quite known as first playing radios at the time. And quite a lot of well known people, you know, from the town of Bradshaw, the Burgesses, and the Armies, these are quite well known names. But there. So you're getting evidence from the assembly about sort of public life. And later on, 1820, when the climate had changed somewhat after the passing of the Act of Union, after the 1798 rebellion, this is a loyal address. This is the citizens of Belfast coming together to say how loyal they were and how they liked the Constitution, didn't want anything to change. And uh, this is a loyal address in the of Belfast to, to the king. Uh, and Volkman signed this. Uh, politics have changed in Belfast, though you will see some of the same names in 1821 who were on the political stuff from the 1780s, interestingly enough. So that's the assembly book. Again, it's a bit of a mess uh, as, as a volume. It's not a coherent list of things that's happened. It's a very interesting source, but the diligent around it. Uh, and, but it is, it, it, it is definitely worth a look. When the current council were considering doing a digital version of it, but I don't know where that project is, has gone at the anywhere. Right, briefly, uh, move on. The time rose rapidly during the uh, 18th century. So by the middle of the 18th century, population of about 8,500. By the end of the century, up to 19,000, Belfast is starting to prosper as a trading centre mainly as the centre of the trading interest in, for the linen trade in North Ireland. Not as yet as a manufacturing centre, very much for, for trade and trade and business coming through. The ports become quite important, even though the port is quite rough and radical. Uh, there's still a lot of uh, trade coming, coming through the port, and Belfast is prospering. Um, the growing town is causing a lot of problems, the public health problems. The corporations would say, um, is in decline during this period to a certain extent. The corporation never did that much. As I said, there's no evidence it was ever sort of regularly, uh, consistently trying to do things in the town, trying to run the town. At the end of the 17th century, the, there's an attempt by some citizens in the town to sort of to, to do a takeover of the corporation or to try and get more influence in it, which is fought off by the Chichester family. The Chichester family fight them off in part by invoking the penal laws, which said that members of corporations and public bodies had been members of the Church of Ireland. Most of the big merchants and leading citizens in the town at that stage were Presbyterians, so that excluded them from being officers in the corporation. By excluding the, the, the sort of very rich, prosperous, important people in the town, they sort of turned their back on the corporation and ignored it. The corporation then really declines because it's really only a body after that which is there to elect the two MPs and do very, very minor things. So it's not actually doing very much in the running of the town. There are other bodies uh, around which do get involved. Now, we don't have very many records of them. There was a manorial grand jury for the town during the 18th century. A grand jury is a very this stage very anachronistic body set up under it, it's, it's a medieval idea when in the plantation they established manners in Ulster, these manners are from different manner grand jury or elite, which is sometimes known. Basically it was a group of citizens who came together at a meeting and were able to raise money to do sort of public works like street cleaning and things like that. Um, the the leads we know exist but there aren't any record as far as I'm aware there are no records of it. You occasionally get 
um, Lewis in the papers. This is from the newsletter. And this is nice and that they have met. Uh, and that they were concerned with the number of pigs running through the streets at the time, which seems to be the main, they thought there would be another problem, but that seemed to be the major problem of 1782. In Belfast, there was too many pigs running on the street, and uh, somebody's had to do with it. Uh, so that I then declare that if they're still running around for the 26th day of this month, they shall be destroyed. We haven't appointed proper persons for this purpose. So they appointed pig catchers. <laughs> Basically, um, so it was essential, you'll notice, among this, essential would have been the Chichester's um, agent, basically. Uh, the the center. I don't know what the area of the manor of Belfast was, probably the same as the parish, so it's probably not the town, it's probably a bigger area than the actual town. And as I say, we know very little. The, the, the court leak did exist, and it's mentioned again in 1835 during, during the public inquiry at that stage that a leak jury exists and they're able to reassess, which is a type of tax. Uh, so presumably there was some public works being done by this uh, royal jury, but exactly how much we don't know. The fact that they don't turn up very much in the paper suggests they weren't doing that much. The other body which is in existence at this stage is the vestry. Um, the vestries of the Church of Ireland have quite an important role during the 18th century in Ireland. They don't just look after the church vestry in Ireland, the Church of Ireland just sort of look after the church property. They have a wider role of looking after the poor, looking after public works. They're quite an important body in rural areas. The Belfast Vestry, we know, draws meat fairly regularly. They're able to raise taxes and they are able to do a few things. Um, they, there, there are numerous references in the newsletter to, to, to the vestry meeting. Um, they were doing street cleaning, they were really concerned with lighting at the time, during the winter they were doing street repairs. At one time they were talking to setting up the police force, a, a town watch. They purchased a fire engine and they appointed the school teacher in the parish. They were doing quite a lot of things. Um, I mean, that effort there, just mentioned it in the meeting, and they were concerned with street cleaning, and they invited the town up in the areas and appointed people to be responsible for street cleaning. Again, so they were doing a lot of some very basic government, government functions. Again, there don't appear to be any records. There was a vestry book, um, but I'm not sure it's still extant. It's not in here. I'm not saying more about that. It may turn up one day. Um, but uh, you can pick up references to them in, in, in the papers uh, in the newsletter. Right, another organization which is set up in town is the Belfast Charitable Society, which is still going to this day. And we'll talk about that. This was an example of, to say, the None of the major inhabitants couldn't be part of the corporate, couldn't be part of the corporation, couldn't get involved in any town that way. But all of them did is to go and get powers from the Irish Parliament to set up a, a body to actually deal with some of the problems in the town. And one of these is the Belfast Charles Society. This was concerned mainly with sort of poverty um, <coughs> in the town. And they set up in 1852 and they raised money and they built a poor house which is the one which is still here this day in Clifton Street, which was a place to look after the poor and, 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 and the needy. They got powers from Parliament to be able to raise money to do that, and they then expand their activities. 1774, they move into accommodating the work of Burhage in 1774, but they, looked, they started building other things. They, they move into the water supply, one of the problems Belfast always had, it was problems in clean water. It was built in a swamp. Uh, you couldn't really drink the water anywhere close to the water. And in 1795, the, the Charles of Sally sends out such a spring water commissioners who are pumping water into or clean water into the centre of Belfast. And the first sort of public reservoir is set up in the Stanmose area, um, <coughs> at the back of um, what's now the Hinkley Vice Chancellor's Lodge in Queens. There was a small reservoir over there, and they brought water into the centre of the town from there. They also open a new graveyard, uh, which is the one on Clifton Street, that's set up by the Charitable Society. So they're, they're involved in a number of activities um, act, to do with actual money at the time. Uh, the Charitable Society, we have a copy in here of the Charitable Society's archive. The main archive is held by the Limbaugh Library. And uh, again, we've all stock of an online version, which as far as I know, it hasn't gone anywhere. Another body that's set up during the 18th century, again by sort of local merchants taking the initiative, is the Ballast Board. 
Uh, as I mentioned, Belfast becomes important as a port, but it isn't a particularly useful port at this stage. Um, Belfast, the junction of the Forest River with the Lagan, and um, sort of slight hill with the mud flats. The rest of this area on out here is mud, and you can see there, which stuck with it, that's all mud. There's a very narrow channel, and that's showing it there is straight, it wasn't straight, it wanted back and forward, out to about here. So there's several miles of mud, very narrow river line through mud flats. So only very small ships could actually get up in the time. Most of them are so I had anchor out here in an area called the Cove Carmaro. And so a trans ship, the stuff from, from, from the ships into small rowing boats, which actually brought them into the town. And uh, this was something that did the growth of Belfast as a port. So it was a ballast board set up to try and improve the harbour and, and access to the harbour. Uh, again, the group of merchants go to the Irish part and get powers from the Irish part and set this up and start work to actually improve the channel into the town and actually to improve the wall and some and all the rest of it actually in the town. And again, they're, they are still growing because that ballast board <coughs> is the predecessor of the Snow and Belfast Harbour Commissioners. Belfast and their body to start actually going into the line, getting uh, from this period. So, as you see, the, the, there's a lot going on. You have corporation, which isn't doing very much, and you have lots of other local committees and bodies being set up to do various, to do various issues. In 1800, there's yet another body set up, which is the police commissioners. Now, they were set up because I mentioned Belfast had grown considerably during the decade towards the end of the century. Obviously, in the 19,000, all sorts of issues with poverty uh, and the state of the town, public health. They don't abolish the corporation because that's not how you did things in those days. They just revive pass it. They set up a new body. They actually set up two bodies, one called the police commissioners, one called the police board. The police commissioners incorporated the old um, corporation. The corporation still existed, but they also became part of this new body with some elected people and there's an elected police board. Both of these are elected on a very narrow franchise, meaning like a very, very small number of people in a property franchise. But they start to do things to actually improve the conditions in the town, and they're <coughs> the most active of these bodies to be set up. Um, they're funded by a poor, poor rate. They're able to raise rates to actually do this, like they actually rate people, and that's quite important to be able to raise money to do it, to be able to borrow money as well. And they do various things at various times, but the main ones were paving, repairing and cleaning the streets, removal of nuisances. Uh, and they also provided them a night watch, uh, a night watchman service, which in due course becomes Belfast Town Police. This last time to 1865, I'll mention more about it in a minute. They also introduced gas lighting into Belfast uh, in 1817, and they set up a fire brigade as well. Uh, it was a fairly complicated race between community bodies and not many people are sort of involved in the actual election of them. But nevertheless, it is a sort of democratic government. So you can argue it's the first sort of democratically elected civic body operating in the town. Uh, their records are to be found in the Belfast City Council archives in the minutes of the council in seven seconds. So there are complete runs of minutes of both the commissioners and the police board. And they give a fairly detailed uh, view of what is happening during this time. There's also their rate books, which are an interesting sort of things really looked at, but they did do give you sort of household survey of Belfast from the 1800 onwards, because every household there had to pay this rate. Right, all of these interesting little bodies are to be swept away in 1842 by a new town council. There'd been a public inquiry in 1833. Um, on to the, the running of the old corporations. They came to Belfast, had them cry and said that the Crow Corporation was doing nothing, which didn't have to come to Belfast to be told of anything. Um, so they decided to abolish it. After a bit of uh, after, after a bit of palaver, it should be said, the commissions in 1833 and the Parliaments in 1842. It didn't happen in those days, but they decided eventually to abolish the old corporation and set up uh, a new body, which is going to be an elected town council. Democratic elected by the ratepayers, again not a very wide franchise, but in principle it's elected by, by the ratepayers to run the town. Um, there are initially 48 councillors elected uh, from five awards, 10 of them and 30 councillors served. Uh, they're elected by the 10 pound male householders, which wasn't a very large body, anyway. It's an election of sorts. 
Uh, and they they appoint a time clerk and a time solicitor, uh, sorry, time clerk and time treasurer. And basically, its body was very much like the councils which we have today. It's a body of elected representatives who operate through committees and who run various services in the town. And this is the body which runs through until the uh, which runs through until 1973. Mm. Um, yes, and as I say, this is the time. This becomes a city. When Belfast comes a city in, in, in 1888. Comes a city council, and Belfast gets over there in 1892. Um, so this is this is this is the this is the Belfast Corporation. We know it from from the City Hall of um, 1906 as the main body running Belfast from the, those days onwards. I'm going to make a slight digression before I get into actual corporation. I just to mention there are other elected bodies operating in the city during the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, something which is sometimes overlooked. The Spring Water Commissioners, which I mentioned, set up by the Charter Commissioners, they eventually become the Belfast Water Commissioners in 1840. And from 1848 to 1973, they manage the water supply in the city. Uh, they levy a water rate from householders. They have elected, they have another elected body, they're elected by, by ratepayers, and, and as I say, they operate the water. Some people from my generation possibly can remember the new water commissioner office, office, office the city hall, which is now Marks and Spencer's building. A very, very powerful body, actually, and they're very able to raise large sums of money for the really big water schemes like the Santa Valley scheme. Uh, quite an important and quite, quite an influential body. I should have left their marks. So there's a big, big archive in India from the end of the AP1. A uh, very big archive, and I to say that there, there was a history done a long time ago, but they're probably worth looking at again. Uh, as a public body. Other big elected body in the, in the town of the state is the Board of Guardians, the Board of Guardians. I'll not get into this very much because it's a separate subject, but the, they're set up in 1838 to run the, the, the new workhouse system, replacing the, the old workhouse, which actually remains as a sort of people's home. The new workhouse system is just to look after the poor, set up under the Board of Guardians of 1838. Another elected body elected by uh, people in the poor rate. Very influential body, they build the workhouse, they build the hospitals, and they get involved in quite a lot of things which we might think of the government, sanitation, drainage, public health, and taking on all those functions. They survived and often surprised people until 1948 in North Ireland. Um, they were abolished in England, guardians in the 1920s, I think they were abolished in 1921 in South Ireland. But they're still through in 1948, so they have these functions. Again, a very important body. Um, and sort of rivals in my way to, to the city council. And the third public body which is running during this period is the harbour commissioners. I mentioned them before, the ballast commissioners become the harbour commissioners. They run the harbour um, again and, very, and do very, very major works there. I think we have been constructed and we're standing here as this is the moment. Well, that's the end of the PowerPoint presentation. Um, second computer is done. Uh, so yes, the um, harbour commission, the, the harbour commissioners still there, and this is actually harbour property that we're standing on, and this is reclaimed land, which wouldn't exist without the harbour commissioners because the old coastline is over where the railway line is. So this is all reclaimed land, we'll work with the Belfast harbour commissioners. Um, so yes, the very important body, very big archive, HHR, one of them looking at, a lot of stories there. It should say that the corporation, the main corporation, made a couple of attempts to take over the, uh, both the Harbour Commissioners and the Water Commissioners, but they're far off. Not so vested interests there. There's, not, there's, no, there's a lot of overlap to me with the bodies, but there's also a lot of vested interests fed each other there. So it's an interesting story. The Lord Mayor, interesting in in character in this context because he's a member, he's one of the few people that actually is, is a member of all these boards by virtue of all, all his office. But getting back to the main council, um, Back right from, from 1842, such running committees. They are initially aren't particularly ambitious. They do take over the police commissioners. The police commissioners were supposed to continue in existence, but the corporation, by legal 
Mr. Cranery, the managed to get the commissioner's bodies and all their powers and functions transferred to them. So they take over the town police and all the other functions that the commissioners are doing. They also buy out the Donegal Fund's remaining right to do their market rights, which is quite important. So they become the market authority. And uh, they take over the remaining memorial rights. And um, this time, the Chichesters, who are well, been bankrupt for a long time, but they were actually had the sale off and got their freehold, which is actually property in the town. So from this time onwards, the Chichester family are no longer really major forces inside the town. They still try to be, they still get involved in politics a bit. And the seventh Marcus is actually the Lord Mayor in 1906 for a year, but they're no longer really running the town. So it's no longer a family town from that time onwards. So the power has passed to, to a new corporation. Um, this is a period of exceptional growth when the council was set up, the population of Belfast 71,000, by 1911 it's 380,000. So it's a big, big growth. Belfast is one of the fastest growing towns in Europe uh, during the part of the 19th century. And there's a huge range of social problems which come on, on the back of that with their career in public health and all the rest of it. Council initially is not that, doesn't appear to be seeing itself as having to do a lot of these things. Um, 1845, then Moore, Andrew Mulholland gives a speech uh, to a sort of charity which is dealing with helping the, 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 the poor and working class. And he says there's lots of things which we need in Belfast that could be for the working classes. We need public parks, we need baths, public baths, we need wash houses, we need a free supply of pure water, we need a library and a reading room, we need coffee houses. Um, but he says this is not the business of council, of town council, nor what they want it to be done by them. But over the remainder of the 19th century, the council does take that over. My old joke used to be that they did everything except the coffee house, but of course the council now does have a coffee house in the city hall. <laughs> but eventually even that bit came true, so they've been asked to buy coffee plants. Uh, but generally of the 19th century, they do actually buy into the, the job of the council to actually provide all these things. This is in line with kind of what cities are doing all over Britain and Ireland and over Europe. To a certain extent, this sometimes being called the municipal gospel, this, this idea of, of well, you have to improve the times and it's the responsibility of councils to actually improve life in the town. So Belfast is at a time buying into those ideas and their council itself, because the town's growing so fast, there's more and more money coming in in rates. So they have money, they're able to borrow money, they get power to borrow money. So they have the money to do things and they have the vision that should be said as well. That they actually want to do things. They want to try and improve the town and they also want to sort of like glorify themselves and Robert was talking the last two weeks about the City Hall. The City Hall is really the apogee of that. The City Hall is a functional building, you know, they need the town hall to do various things and it didn't need to be like that, it didn't need to cost what it cost. But that was just that, you know, it's the people in the run the council who wanted to leave a line with themselves to show how important they were, how rich they were, how much innovation they had of themselves. Um, so the council was able to say to raise lots of money, they were able to use private acts of parliament. The council didn't have power to do things, they could go to the parliament and ask for an act of parliament. It was called the private act, you're given the power. Between 1845 and 1930, the council of the corporation gets 46 separate acts of parliament passed. They used to have a uh, volume of these, the council then printed them all up neatly into one huge volume, 1200 pages of text of these private acts, which deal with everything from street improvements, building regulations, Administration of the police and fire brigade, regulation of the markets and slaughterhouses, absolutely everything is in there in, in, in these acts of parliament. And we're able to raise as well huge sums of money to do these. There's a row in the 1850s, the council sort of overreached itself. Uh, there's a big row, they're taking the courts because they're spending money they don't have the right to spend. Uh, there's rows about political corruption as well. That ends badly, the council kind of lose what's called the Chancery case. The end town clerk is sort of forced to sack. Is sacked and he's also sort of being political. And I believe in the town guy called John Bates. But it doesn't really slow the council down very much. They, they continue to do these very large self improvement projects. And these would be things like um, the creation of corporate street of Victoria Street, spraying the land, building those big new modern streets, building Royal Avenue, the most in the old slum area of Hartley Street, building the new Royal Avenue through it. Uh, those are council projects. Uh, bringing the drainage schemes, new, 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 new drainage streams, uh, put in um, things like that, sewers, and also a lot of concern with public health. Public health is a big concern in all Victorian cities. Cities were unhealthy, Victorian cities. Lots of people crowding in the city, poor housing, poor conditions, poor sanitations, 
results in a lot of disease. It's in everybody's interest to try and clean them up and, and get them working again. So the council is able to use the control of the market to regulate food sales to try and ensure that the food is being properly stored and, and produced. They built new markets, uh, buildings at Oxford Street, George's Market. They built the first public abattoir in Belfast. In order, in order to build a public abattoir, the whole council goes to Paris in 1870 because, as we all know, we want to look at a public abattoir, Paris is the place to go. So the whole council takes us up to Paris um, to look at abattoirs as a control the way that they in. Um, and so you get new abattoirs being built. Um, they also building wash houses and baths. As mentioned, the baths there. These are not swimming baths. This is not leisure facilities. These are actually public baths. You know, there is no running water in houses. If you want to keep clean, where, where are you going to go? Certainly you can't wash any of the rivers in Belfast, which are all heavily polluted. So the answer to that is public baths, public wash houses, and the council starts to provide these from from the 1850s onwards. Sorry, from, from the 1870s on, there's a better around that. That's one of the things they want the charities to do to start with. From 1879, the first one is the Peter Shell, one from Peter Shell, followed by things like Omar Avenue, Tucker Avenue. So they start to provide sort of public baths for people, again, as part of this public health functions. Burial grounds, as we mentioned, the old Shankill Cemetery was full. The, the new cemetery opened by the Charles Society fills up as well. So the city council takes that on and they build what becomes City Cemetery which opens in 1869 as uh, Belfast Burial Ground and then they extend that to Dundonald later and then Rose Park and that becomes one of the major uh, council functions. And also parks, I mentioned the new parks and again parks are seen not as a leisure or something as such and play football in but as public health you basically need an open green space somewhere in, in the town so you know, it's a clean the air for people to actually go to. Um, the first public park in Belfast is actually private. Tannic Garden was, was a private park opened in 1828, which the public were, and there's admission charge and working class were allowed in free in certain days of the year and they must behave themselves. But it's not until 1870 that you started getting municipal parks. Uh, the first starting with Ormo, which they buy from Orc County Law. Sometimes they claim that they gave the land to them, we didn't, we sold it to them. And uh, so that's the first public park, and you get more parks after that. Falls Alexander, we built in Victoria, and in 1895, the Council buys Botanic Gardens from the, the company that owned it, and they become open public parks. One area where they failed to get a park was in the centre of Belfast, um, which would be a bit more right in the centre of the town, but somewhere around here. And then public health, I've mentioned, is it, the big driving force for, for a lot of these changes. Uh, a medical superintendent officer of health is appointed in the 1880s, a bit late after that other times have done it. And the first one is actually the retired, uh, retired mayor of the council, the council of the Senecure job. But months after him take it a bit more seriously and they start to work dealing with infectious diseases, reporting diseases, looking for nuisances as they're called pollution, cleaning up the streets and dealing with those issues. The medical superintendent officers reports are very, very important so we're resource for the 18th and early 20th century and they run right through them. The 20th century, very interesting documents, a lot of statistics, but a lot of sort of examples of what's going on in the town, how they're cleaning up houses, how they're looking after children. I particularly recommend the ones from the 1930s, when there's a guy called Donaldson, he's quite entertaining because he finds his job as a writer and he uh, can be quite unconsciously entertaining, but he gives you an example of what, gives you an idea of what the children are concerned about, what they see the issues in the town. And um, actual medical hospitals not, are not a council function, uh, although they do become involved with the fever hospital, the Prince and the fever hospital is a council responsibility because that is sort of fever and infectious diseases. They also, and then after the first war, they take over the management of the sanatorium for tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is a big killer in the 19th, early 20th century, so council takes over the responsibility for the sanatorium. There. They also have a disinfectant station, a quarantine station out just out the river from us on the West Twin at the end of the island there, which is now on Durham Road. But that was an island at one stage and on the island they built this little hospital. It was a quarantine station and they should come in with anybody dodgy. And it should be enough off the room on this island and they stayed in this hospital out there until they were cleared. So that's now completely gone, but that's another of our functions, Port, Port, Port Health Officer, for, for, for the Port. The area that the company falls in the health is, is mental health. Um, I'm responsible for building a party burn as a new uh, mental health facility in the 1905. 
very interesting building, um, particularly new in this day, and brand new and very modern type of mental health hospital. Um, they're not really responsible for running it, they are responsible for funding, and it's quite complicated to Libraries, which is another thing that comes in in the 1880s, public libraries, they built uh, for Central Library and Royal Avenue, very ornate building, they got into the idea that they could raise money and build these very impressive buildings. The joke was about the library when they didn't, they didn't have any money left for books. So you had a very interesting building, which had this very nice ground floor, if you still go into today, which found very impressive ground floor, that like marble. So it wasn't really public functions there for that city girls, and uh, dance and receptions there. But a, couple of people, a lot of people who want their sort of functions come out and they can be sending books. That's because they didn't have any money. And one idea they had initially was an in-hall library, since you really didn't need two libraries in time, but then closed down and gave them all the books. Linden Hall didn't see it that way, so it took them further away to build up the bookstock. And later on, you, you do get branch libraries. And again, though, they're always a bit slow with libraries, and really, they only get branch libraries when Carnegie comes through with the money. Uh, and you get those Carnegie libraries, like uh, the ones in Linden Hall, Park Avenue, and I'm just going to talk about where Carnegie was, there's one in Linden Hall Road, uh, and Falls, of course, for Chanel. Chanel. Yeah, from Chanel. Very impressive building, but the only reason money was coming from Carnegie. Technical education is another area that Victoria and Tony, uh, parents gets involved in. They weren't responsible for schools until after the First World War, but initially technical education is very important in a, a town like Belfast, where the town is so much in the industry. So Belfast Tech opens in 1906. A very impressive building, never mind it's blocking the view of inst still have to go over it. It's a very, very interesting building, uh, and very impressive, and very well built as well upstairs. It hasn't it's been recorded. It hasn't been particularly well looked after by the people who actually won the kind of won the college later days. It was very badly neglected. Uh, but it was a very interesting building. And that was combined uh, Technical College and School of Art. Very good records for it in here, by the way, PCT archive, uh, very interesting area of study. Uh, other things the council is doing, they're running three large public trading utilities. Uh, they take over the gas supply uh, in 1874 on the gas company in, in the city supplying gas to a very big area, not just the city, but well beyond the city as well, which is very profitable undertaking. The profits are used for various things like building the new city hall. Um, they also sell an electricity undertaking, which is needed to actually run electric trams and other things, but they start selling electricity, again, a very profitable business. So they're running with the gas and electricity in the city. As I say, they, they buy over the Belfast Street tramway system and electrify those in a tram system, which eventually becomes buses, becomes the you know, Belfast Corporation Transport Committee. So it's a very, those are very big trading enterprises. So it's a very, very big organization um, by the 20th century, you know, which is supplying, you know, supplying gas and electricity, transport, looking at all various things, public health, various services like um, cottages and uh, Libraries. The town expands, as I say, during, during, the, during the 19th century. There are a couple of boundary extensions to don't bore you with, but by 1896, the town covers 23 square miles. Um, at that stage, anyway, most of the people living in Belfast lived inside the town boundary. This is not the case later on, but at that stage, it was fairly coherent inside it. And it's um, 1887, worth mentioning all Belfast householders, including women, are entitled to vote. First Council in Ireland to do that. So we're forward looking in many ways. In 1888, Belfast becomes a city, after much arguing about whether it was going to cost any money. 1892, they acquired the title of Lord Mayor, uh, mainly to annoy Dublin, as he said. Um, and in 1898, Belfast becomes a county borough, which is a wonderfully boring technical thing, but Belfast is the first county. Takes over the responsibilities of the county council in the city areas. As part of becoming a county, they get things like a grand jury and a high shelf in the local town as well. So basically, that is the corporation as it is down to 1973. Um, I'll say a wee bit about the important figures in this are the mayors and Lord Mayors. The, you have a lot of very rich people in, in, in the city in the 19th century, and many of them become involved in actually running the city. So people like Edward Harlan, Daniel Dixon, William Perry, Otto Joff, all major businessmen all become mayor or, or, or Lord Mayor. Um, it's their chance to be back in, in the community as they've seen it. 
very useful because the city council didn't actually pay the Lord Mayor anything until after the Second World War. So it won't be a Lord Mayor you have that money because you pay for it out of your own pocket. So it was useful to getting these very rich people in to actually do this. But these rich people want someone to show off, which is why you get the city hall basically built in the style of walls so that they can actually own, they can actually put on these functions. Um, 20th century, uh, just run through very briefly. Um, the city continues to grow. I mean, Belfast properties in the city boundary probably peaks about 18, actually 1951 at 440,000, which is about double what the properties in the city town boundary now. One of the most densely populated um, towns in, in Britain, if not in Europe, very densely populated area, huge amount of people. Uh, the corporation continues to innovate, take on new powers. The establishment of Northern Ireland, 19, Northern Ireland State in 1921, there's a bit of tension between the, the corporation and the new government installment. Uh, so tension both ways, a little bit both unionist control, there's a lot, there, 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 there are sort of tensions there because the Northern Ireland government wants to sort of control what, what, what the corporation is doing. The corporation is saying we're a much older body and we have more money than you anyway. Uh, so there's, there's, there's a bit of friction there during, during these years. Again, it hasn't really been looked at very much. You also get the corporation increasingly being restricted to particularly high offices to a relatively small number of people. Between 1920 and 1946, you only have four people as Lord Mayor. Three of them for a very long period, one on Prophet McCulloch, uh, 16 years as Lord Mayor. So the city offices are being held by a very small number of people. It's become very enclosed. Uh, and also because the elite have any opposition, it's the union group being elected all, 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 all the time. Continues to take on new functions. Uh, 1923 it becomes the education authority for the city. They start building new schools. Um, they, they closed down a lot of the older, smaller primary schools. They took over from the church to build bigger new schools. Quite good modern designs as well. Schools built in the 1920s and 30s. These schools like Seaview and North Belfast have very good designs. Um, There's continued to do infrastructure projects on a smaller way. The Latin Boulevards and the of the Latin or 1930s um, production, uh, new bridges, uh, works on, on the River Lagan, uh, municipal aerodrome, 1924, alone, so doesn't last very long, we're thinking ahead. The Austin Museum, 19, uh, 1929, that's Belfast Council again, this is their new museum, new zoo for the 1930s in Bellevue. And they also acquire, again, it's often said about workshops we gifted them. Um, or at least they did a deal with it. They bought some land over some of the land and they got this free. But they take over Bellevue and they still develop it as a pleasure park. Um, one of the areas that come involved in the 20th century is housing. Not involved in the 19th century. In the 19th century, Belfast working class housing is thought to be quite good, actually, by contemporary standards. You start to get issues after the First World War. The council in, in the 1920s does start with an agenda to build houses, and they build two and a half thousand council houses in a very short period. Unfortunately, there's then public inquiry into how these contracts are being let, which uh, doesn't end well for the then Lord Mayor of Gordon McCulloch, who was to make one of his first breaks from public office. One result of that is the council stops housing building, which was kind of very really much later. Just say that's your attitude, we're not going to build any. And so it's not until after the second war they start housing again, by which stage the housing stock is in very poor condition and it becomes one of the major issues in the second half of the 20th century. There's also complaints about corruption, as I say, um, there's a relatively small number of people actually running the council elected officials, it's become a bit messy. There was a big thing called the White Abbey Sanatorium inquiry in 1941, the papers are all here, and we've been looking for a project, I recommend it. I can't work out what the hell is happening, something is going on, it's only worth taking a living at. As a result of that, the no Northern government suspends the council for three years, which the commissioners are on it. That's the reason given, the other reason it's often given for the government doing that is because of the air raids, in fact, the lack of preparation for the air raids in 1941, which were killed. The council corporation gets the blame for not being ready, although the manager was actually the Northern government responsibility, so we can shaft over that. However, people are all here, you know, in the project or something. Post war, you have the bill for a state coming in, so the state's taking on more responsibilities, and the council corporation's taking on more responsibilities. New health and welfare committees are established, board of guardians are abolished, 
Corporation takes a responsibility for children, the elderly, children's homes, and the consequence of that, old people's homes, at least in prevention responsibilities. Um, health committees get involved in new areas, public health, school health as well, child health, projects being set up. Education system expands rapidly, the country funds grammar schools and secondary schools. Housing is the one area where the cause is the most controversy. At the end of the war, it's reckoned they need 22,000 houses urgently. The council does start building, but they're building 500 a year, which isn't enough. Again, you can argue it wasn't really their fault, there wasn't enough land in city. We allowed to build inside the city boundary, there wasn't enough land inside the city boundary. They weren't able to get the power to do it. That's probably going to be impossible, no land government should be doing it anyway. However, they do build a lot of houses during this period, and um, they get involved in some sort of new planning, things are going on. But increasingly, planning has been done on a larger regional scale, so a lot of the powers the corporation was, had been moved out to Northern Ireland government. In 1973, they established a new Northern Ireland government system, uh, whereby most of the responsibilities undertaken by the corporation are transferred to regional government, to the Northern Ireland Executive, or to the Northern Ireland Departments. So responsibility for roads, water, electricity, housing, all of that stuff goes to, to, to the government bodies who are running across the world in Northern Ireland. And the council is left, and I'm not careful of our words, how many councillors are there? Uh, the council is left with not a lot to do, to be quite honest. Um, things, the, the weight is changing again, um, and we're getting a new council system for next year where more responsibility is actually going back to local councils. So we'll see how that works out. Um, but the main version of this, that was a very rapid clap, I went through it without any pictures. The council archive is here. It's a very well recorded. It's, it's, it's a huge collection, basically. It's you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff there for the corporation. It's glory days, 1842, 1973, particularly the 20th century. Um, I've mentioned some of the highlights in, in, in the handout. I would suggest the starting point. The starting point for doing any research is the minute books. Go into those first minutes and the council, particularly the committees, because most of the work actually come from the committees. Minutes are there, they give you a, a, a good overview of what's there. Letter books for town clerks and the town solicitors, who are often seen first from a very interesting source. Uh, town solicitors' papers are very interesting, they don't sound very interesting, but you know, those, they, if you're working government, you know you always need to watch out for a little thing before you do anything. So those are very interesting, they're very interesting, they're very interesting. <coughs> the problems they have. Financial records are there as well, you can see where the rates are coming from, where the money's coming from. Lord Mayor's correspondence is quite entertaining. It, it dates, it survives from 1931, it's a <coughs> second coming as Lord Mayor's were, and he makes a political comeback. Uh, very, very good detailed archive there, you can see actually what the Lord Mayor was getting up to. Um, gas undertaking is very well um, recorded, it's a huge amount of stuff for the gas, so the whole history of that meant to be written. Transport archive is also very good, and the public health archive. All those I've been recommending. I'm trying to get somebody to do a paper of a study on public health in 1920s and 30s in Belfast. Again, very good, very entertaining files at the moment. So that's about it. Sorry for the technical hitches. Um, um, I'm sorry for the first drop drop delivery towards the end. I hope there's been some use to you. And I will take any questions if anybody has any.